Welcome to the Sage Thought Leadership Podcast, transforming the way people think and work so their organizations can thrive. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to our podcast. I'm Ed Kless, and with me today is my colleague, Paul Wyatt. Paul is an experienced relationship builder, life coach, and mentor. By day, he works to assist CPAs and bookkeepers in building their practice with the using effective accounting solutions. At night, he's a life coach and mentor to men who struggle with relation, relational, I should say, brokenness. In all walks of life, he sees value in building relationships as well as seeing value in the person standing before them. During his spare time, he managed to find to be a single dad of three great kids. Welcome <laughs> to the Sage Thought Leadership Podcast, my colleague, Paul Wyatt. Hey, Ed, good morning. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, first off, Paul, we, t- we hear what you do, but why do you do what you do? So, I mean, I'm passionate about people. So, first and foremost, I, you know, I find people very intriguing. So, whether it's, you know, watching people in restaurant environments, um, studying people groups, um, which was my major in college, um, social sciences, um, or just getting to know them on a personal level. It's, you know, I'm passionate about that. And when it comes to our accountants and CPAs, um, I'm passionate about what they do. One thing I learned during COVID is how valuable they are. You know, nurses and doctors, and I tell them all the time, nurses and doctors, they get the credit that they deserve being heroes and what they did during that period during the pandemic. But accountants, I mean, from an economic standpoint, you know, they were the backbone, whether you're talking about PPP loans or um, just a lot of changes from, from a taxation standpoint. Um, small businesses wouldn't have been able to thrive um, especially the boom of small businesses during pandemic with people's, you know, new startups and whether it's masks, it's other things that they do. People found passions to do while they were home. Um, accountants, if it wasn't for accountants, that wouldn't have been possible. And tell me your thoughts about building on relationships through this notion of transparency. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a firm believer in transparency in all walks of life, whether with my children, I found being a single parent for, you know, six, seven years and still going down that single parent path is one of the biggest things that I discovered with them is the more transparent I was, the more transparent they were with me. So I was able to build not just a relationship as a like father, son, father, daughter, um, but we became friends through that process. And I look at working with people the same way. So, you know, when I'm on the phone with accountants, it's not about get putting them into a product. I can put you into a product all day, but if it doesn't fit your practice, doesn't fit your need, then I'm really doing you a disservice. So I'm big on on transparent selling and making sure that they know exactly what the product is, what they're getting and how it fits their practice. And we work, you know, through an enablement process to get that done. Um, But to me, transparency is key in building trust, right? If I'm open and honest and I'm transparent with whoever I'm I'm encountering and through walks of life, whether it's colleagues at Sage, whether it's accountants, CPAs, my children, people I meet in the workplace, people I meet out just in the field, you know, just doing things that I do, um, or even working with with men that I work with in the evening. If I'm not transparent and honest with them, um, then there's just no trust, you know. And trust is the key to really every relational aspect, whether it's marriage, whether it's it's parenting, whether it's being in the workplace, um, or you know, just walking through you know the walk of life, you know, because life is messy. You know, your journey can be messy, but you know, if you're transparent and honest, and you walk that walk of character, um, it goes a long way. Do you have a definition that you use, a working definition of transparency? Open and honest. You know, when when I speak of transparency, it is I'm going to be as open as I can. I'm going to be transparent and honest with you. So when we have dialogue, regardless of what it's about, you know, there's an openness to it. You know, there is a a fluid two-way dialogue of two people being transparent being honest with one another, um, even if it's brutal. Sometimes honesty is hard. Um, you know, whether you're, you're working with someone, trying to help them through some relational issues or marriage issues, um, or you're a parent, sometimes you have to be honest. And that honesty can be not exactly what people want to hear. So um, I, I think open and honest would be the two words that I would look at from a transparency standpoint. And I want to jump back to something that you mentioned in your opening, and that is your, your study in college of, of people groups. And wanted to ask you a little bit about that, just from a, a decision-making standpoint. How, what 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 does your your study or or even the, the the your experience tell you about the dynamics of group decision making? Wow. So group decision making. I mean, it's that's tough. So 
you know, I, and this is something I struggle with for, for years, even, even what I do at Sage now and working in some of the groups that we do, um, the dynamic of group decision-making is, I mean, you just have so many different personalities. Um, you know, when, you know, we did a study um, through our social sciences um, professor, you know, put us through this class where we had to study the, the study of people groups. So part of it was the genocide in Rwanda. And mm-hmm. it was probably the hardest thing that, that I ever had to sit back and look at. Um, and then seeing, um, you know, one of my personal heroes, Paul Russicabina, who not only took time during that period to help his people, you know, but just a, a leader in just peace involvement, if you would. Right. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the when you start talking about, you know, people groups and decision making, whether you're looking at, you know, political decision making um, or you're looking in the workplace or, or, you know, 501c3 nonprofits, you know, a lot of times people allow their own agenda, you know, what they want, you know, what they desire to kind of rule what they want to do in life and in, in, in the dire- direction of that decision making process. And I think that's where we get ourselves in, in trouble, especially from a political standpoint. And, you know, you just look at agendas it, is what, you know, what it's all about. And I think we find that in the workplace. I think we find it even with friendships and even marriages and family. So I, you know, that's probably to me, the one thing that I think holds a lot of us back when it comes to group decision-making is we allow our own agenda and emotion to get involved rather than looking at numbers or looking at the science behind what we do while we do it. And Paul, we have an exit question that we ask all of our guests and that is who is a hero of yours and why are they a hero? Yeah. So I just, I touched on it a little bit, you know, got a little gun shy there, but we did, you know, we did a study on the genocide in Rwanda uh, when I was in college. And, you know, it took place in 1994. I was 17, 16 when it happened. So I didn't, you know, obviously at that age, you don't really understand what's going on in the world. Um, you know, but as I got older and I, I had a chance to study it, I really studied the life of Paul Russis Cabina. Um, and he did what he did for his people during that time, regardless of what side, you know, you were on you know, he was a peacemaker and he, whether it was his own finances, um, the hotel he ran and, and causing it as a, as a safe place, having it as a safe place, um, or just standing up against the militant that was coming at his family and at the people that he cared for. Um, he became a hero of mine at a very young age um, because I thought he was a man of character. I thought he did what he had to do to save his people and his faith based and just what he, what he stood on um, is something that that I think a lot of us miss in life is, you know, what what do we stand for? Because, you know, the famous saying, if we stand for, if we don't stand for something, we stand for nothing, you know. So I just, Paul Ruskabina is, is just been a hero of mine. He still is a hero of mine, um, you know. So I, I still follow closely a little bit of, you know, the story there. Even my daughter, who, you know, is in college now, she goes to Columbus State, she had to watch it for one, watch Hotel Rwanda for one of her movies, and I'm just sitting there watching her cry. And and at the end, she's like, "What he did was incredible," and I'm like, "It was, you know, what he did was nothing short of amazing." And lastly, Paul, how can somebody contact you? So you can contact me um, through my email at sage paul dot y it's w y a t is and tom t is and tom at sage dot com. Um, you can always contact my cell phone number. It's four seven zero nine one zero six one one four, and my Twitter, which is Paul Wyatt oh three oh five, um, for my Twitter handle. Um, and those are really the best ways to get in contact with me, or LinkedIn actually, which is the same thing, Paul Wyatt oh three oh five. So, all right, my Sage colleague Paul Wyatt, thanks so much for being a guest on the Sage Thought Leadership Podcast. Thank you, Ed. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Review and subscribe by searching your podcast player of choice for Sage Thought Leadership Podcast.